Hello, 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 and welcome. Happy Friday to you all. And welcome to this webinar. Um, thank you for being with us today. Sorry, we're starting a few minutes late, but uh, now that we're getting going, I'd like to welcome you all and get us started. Um, thank you for joining the Center for Applied Linguistics for this 90 minute panel based discussion on the topic of assessing multilingual learners for success. This webinar is being recorded and it's going to be posted to cal.org immediately after our event. Um, and there will be closed captioning available for this uh, webinar as well. If you'd like to turn that on, you can press the closed captioning button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So let's make sure that that is on. There we are. We are joined by four esteemed experts in their fields who work at the intersection of research policy and practice uh, in the assessment and instruction of multilingual learners. We're very lucky to have so much knowledge on one call, and we encourage you, the audience, to ask us any questions that come to your mind via the Q&A box below. We will address as many questions as we can get to at the end of our discussion today. In addition, you can click on the chat button that's at the bottom of your screen at any time to share your thoughts and comments. Uh, special note about the chat box, because it is uh, a flurious, I guess, with a lot of comments, we won't be checking that regularly. Um, but why don't you go ahead and try it now? Tell us where you're calling in from. Uh, the Center for Applied Linguistics is providing this event as a public service. However, the views and thoughts and opinions expressed belong solely to the persons expressing them and do not necessarily represent the views of the Center for Applied Linguistics. Finally, before we begin, make sure to mute your microphones now to avoid any interruptions during the presentation. Now I'd like to turn it over to our moderator for today's panel discussion, Dr. Kira Ballantyne. Kira? Thank you, Trey. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. My name is Kira Ballantyne. I'm the Vice President for Programs and Development here at the Center for Applied Linguistics. I'll be serving as your moderator today, and I am excited to facilitate what promises to be a visionary and forward-looking conversation about assessment practices that lead to success for our multilingual learners. I'm so honored to be joined by four esteemed experts in the field. I'd like to first introduce Micheline Shaloub Deville. Dr. Shaloub Deville is professor, professor of Educational Research Methodology at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and the recipient of the 2022 Charles A. Ferguson Award for Outstanding Scholarship. Prior to UNC Greensboro, she worked at the University of Minnesota and the University of Iowa. Her professional activities have also included a term as visiting professor at the Lebanese American University and serving at UNC Greensboro as interim associate provost for undergraduate education, director of Ashby Residential College and director of the Coalition for Diversity in Language and Culture. Professor Shaloub Deville is a past president of the International Language Testing Association. So welcome Micheline. Next, I'd like to introduce my colleague here at Cal, Justin Kelly. Dr. Kelly is the Senior Director for the Language Assessment Department at Cal. He oversees the development of test materials and the integration of the test development team with other teams at Cal and with external partners. He has many years of experience managing all aspects of test development from the development of test and item specifications through the item development and review process to the test validation phase. Before coming to Cal, Dr. Kelly was a test developer, test development manager, and the director of business operations at Second Language Testing Inc., where he worked on many high profile projects such as the National Assessment of, for Educational Progress, otherwise known as NAEP, the Pearson Test of English, and a number of tests for the federal government. Dr. Kelly received his BA in Applied Linguistics and Spanish from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and his MS and PhD in Theoretical Linguistics from Georgetown University. I'm also delighted to introduce the Chair of Cal's Board of Trustees, Liying Chang. Dr. Chang is Professor and Director of the Assessment and Evaluation Group in the Faculty of Education in Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Her seminal research on washback illustrates the global impact of large-scale testing on instruction, 
the relationships between assessment and instruction and the academic and professional acculturation of international and new immigrant students, workers and professionals to English speaking countries. An underrepresented population in the research, but one whose lives are greatly impacted by testing and assessment. Li Ying conducts her research within the context of teaching and learning English as a second and foreign language, including in multilingual and immersion contexts. She holds more than $2 million of research funding with more than 160 publications in language assessment and has presented to teachers at 250 conferences globally. Finally, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Aida Walke. Dr. Walke's career in the field of second language development spans several decades, all levels of education and multiple countries. She taught at the Catholic University in Lima, at Alisal High School in Salinas, California for six years, at Stanford University and at the University of California, Santa Cruz. For the last 22 years, she's worked at WestEd, where she started one of its signature programs, the Quality Teaching for English Learners or QTEL initiative focused on the development of deep educator expertise to support the rigorous development of English learners conceptual, analytic, literacy and languages, language practices in subject matter areas. She currently directs the National Research and Development Center to improve the education of English learners in secondary schools housed at WestEd. A native Peruvian, Dr. Walke received an MS in sociolinguistics from Georgetown University and her PhD from Stanford University. She's the author of many books and articles, including the recent Reconceptualizing the Role of Critical Dialogue in American Classrooms, Promoting Equity Through Dialogic Education, published by Routledge. So thank you to my esteemed colleagues for joining me today, and thank you to all of you in our audience for joining us today to talk about this important topic. Um, our format today is gonna to be a panel discussion, but to kick us off, um, Micheline is going to walk us through um, a few slides. So um, Micheline, I'd like to start with you and um, please go ahead. Um, in your work, you've discussed taking a multilingual orientation to assessment um, and you've said, and I'm quoting, an integrated multilingual construct which emphasizes features such as pluralistic communication and translanguaging requires that we transform our value systems, rethink test takers' experiences, reconsider L2 constructs, and overhaul testing operations. Micheline, please tell us more about what this means. Thank you, Kira, and welcome to everybody who's able to join us here virtually. I uh, would like to thank uh, the Center for Applied Linguistics for putting on this panel, and it is a privilege to be a uh, part of a panel that includes uh, the people who are on it today. I am looking forward to the conversation that we will be having. Um, and as Kira said, I was asked to kick off uh, the conversation with a few slides. I am a faculty. You can't just say a few slides. It's like I breathe and five slides emerge. So I have about 10, 12 slides, but you know, that's the sin of being a professional in academia. Um, so when we talk about multilingual constructs and testing, this is not a topic that is well worn out in the field. We've talked about it for years. This is very much a new conversation, sadly, but true. Uh, perhaps in applied linguistics at large, we've talked about multilingual constructs. And I would venture to say that even in applied linguistics at large, the conversation is more or less emerging rather than it is established. And that's important because testing usually doesn't lead. Usually it follows. It looks to see what constructs have been elaborated and then in the field, we try to apply them. So usually we're not the group that leads uh, the charge on new frontiers in, in, in terms of constructs. So in my own work, um, I have been a typical language tester for over a quarter of a century. I've done uh, what I would consider to be progressive work, but this progressive work has been very much um, 
informed by standard practices in the field. And this, the standard practices have been monolingual in terms of the construct and how we measure it. So our panel today, I, I, I trust through the conversation, will talk about multilingual constructs, policies, testing, teacher professional development, and perhaps the assessment of content and the role that language plays in that. Can you see my screen okay? Is it, uh, uh, do you have notes or anything that is uh, causing any trouble? Yeah. Micheline, yeah, we're getting a little bit of um, comment in the chat. I think perhaps what we're gonna do is I'm gonna present for you. So if you give me okay. one second, I'll pull up the slides sharing. and you just let me know when you want to go through these slides. So okay. let's just take a second to make sure that I have everything set up. Thank you everyone for your patience. Um, and we're on the first slide. So as Kira is setting up the slides at her end, you know, sometimes technology works and sometimes it gives you trouble. Um, but as the state of affairs, as I mentioned, in the field of language testing uh, um, are such that we are still working primarily with a monolingual construct. Second slide, please. We're working with a monolingual construct, and that is what you typically see in standardized testing, and I would say even in classroom-based assessment. Moving to third slide. So uh, documented language use and interactions demand that language testing operations also consider multilingual construct. This is something that uh, is talked about uh, in uh, uh, language learning and language teaching. And you see special issues published on the topic such as the MLJ special issue of 2011. Elana, Sohami, and colleagues, uh, Ofra, Embar, and others have been doing work in this area, and they talk about uh, uh, the interest and the need to include first languages, second languages, and third languages, and to have them interact in ways that they normally do in real life, and have that be the state of affairs as well as in language testing. Next slide. So when we talk about, okay, I have it differently here. All right. When we talk about multilingualism, one concept that we hear increasingly is translanguaging. So multilingualism and translanguaging is the construct that I'm talking about in my publications. It is not multilingualism where we have two languages that sit side by side and behave nicely and they do not inv invade each other's turfs. These are languages that interplay, that invade one another's territories, that appear in somebody's uh, uh, conversation, perhaps in the same sentence. So translanguaging allows us to mix and match. It's a heteroglossic approach or ideology to representing uh, bilingualism and multilingualism. And translanguaging can be said to be a disruptive concept when it comes even to multilingualism. So it's not just disruptive to a monolingual representation, it is also disruptive to a multilingual representation. Next. Okay, that's the one. So it, it has a positive orientation and it is disruptive, thank you. So when you do a side-by-side -side, uh, comparison of multilingualism, monolingualism, and to use the headings that we've used in the past, additive and subtractive bilingualism, in work that I have published, this is how I see it. In a subtractive perspective or ideology, monolingualism reigns supreme. We talk about interlanguage and code switching. This is from way back 60s and 70s language, but we continue to talk about those today. Uh, in contrast, in an additive disruptive mon multilingualism, we're talking about a plurilinguistic reality and community of uh, conversants. We're talking about resources that are multilingual and displayed multilingually. We're talking about not code switching, which tends to have negative connotation. We're talking about translanguaging, which celebrates languages and celebrates our repertoire. 
instead of hiding our repertoire. We're talking about not language use, but communication as it appears in communities. We certainly are not talking about the idealized native speaker or the well-educated native speaker or whatever incarnation of the native speaker. We are talking about real world communicators where we bring different strengths. Where the emphasis is communication and the onus of responsibility doesn't fall on the non-native speaker. It falls on everybody to get the meaning across. Task is generic, it's not necessary evil. Uh, when we talk about it in a standardized or classroom traditional testing, the way I look at it in an additive disruptive approach, the task is not just integrated, it is multimodal. We see integrated testing tasks in many standardized testing today uh, systems such as TOEFL and others, but I'm also talking about a multimodal representation of tasks. So instead of talking about fixed, standardized tests, we're talking about fluid, ongoing assessment that is perhaps embedded into learning. Some have called it stealth assessment, dynamic assessment. So the connections to real world are weakened with a, subtract, a subtractive perspective. It is strengthened. It is based on ethnographic research of how people communicate in real life. Finally, uh, policy engagement is traditionally shunned, especially in academia. We stay away from what we would call politics. In this new approach, we realize that policy is where everything is happening and we, I call on policy engagement. Next, please. Uh, when talking about the reality of things, as I said, in testing, we don't lead, we follow in terms of construct representation. Also, we don't just develop a test and just you know, sit there. Usually you have a client, an organization that comes to you and asks you to develop a test. And so we respond to the demands of the request. So in that instance, what we do is dictated by a client or some outfit out there. However, I've always argued that we wear two hats usually. We wear the hat of an operational, professional, but we also wear a hat of a researcher. So as research professionals, we also need to in, engage in pushing the field forward, in trying to see what is happening at large in the real world and other disciplines and bringing that into language testing and making it a reality in language testing. Because our colleagues in learning, in professional development, may be talking, and if we don't take up the baton and walk the walk with them, the circle is incomplete. Everything falls apart. So testing plays an important role. Thank you. Um, when talking about the construct of multilingualism in assessment, I say it again, it's a heteroglossic language representation where language is fluid and flexible and it is this, uh, uh, deployed as needed by task, by interactants. And there are different ways to actually display uh, uh, one's achievement. So this approach promotes diverse ways of processing content learning and documenting achievement. Next. So again, we must deal with real world communication and the, you know, the golden question is, do we know how to develop? analyze, score, and validate multilingual assessments. We can say we, 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 we have a construct in uh, uh, applied linguistics, but do we know how to do what we typically do in testing in order to make that a reality? Next. So I think one thing that has been talked about in language testing is learning-oriented assessment versus assessment of learning. In learning-oriented assessment, this is something that can connect not just large-scale assessment, but classroom assessment to what is happening uh, uh, in a classroom by teachers or what is needed in order to document content-based learning. Next. So learning-oriented uh, assessment has been talked about uh, for example, by uh, my colleague uh, from Cambridge, Nick Saville, says it locates learning at the heart of all assessment contexts. 
And I've seen in accountability testing, we're learning and the teacher being at the center of a figure, at the center of, uh, uh, of operations. But in reality, the test kind of sidetracks everything and comes stealthily and dictates to teachers what they need to teach. In learning oriented assessment, we truly put learning at the heart of the figure of the operation and we take it from there. Learning oriented assessment is there to serve the educational needs, to serve the needs of the students. It's not to make the students reconfigure themselves to fit into our standardized box, but it's about celebrating what the students bring to, to, to the game and working from there. And I've talked about how this is also the case with, in principle, with accountability testing, which has been talked about all over the world. And the term that is talked about these days is global education reform movement. And you see it in various countries, in various guises. I think at the heart of such a, 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 a movement, in principle, is improved learning. But the way we go about doing it, we sabotage learning completely. And we certainly sacrifice multilingualism. Moving on. So in my research, one approach that I've investigated with uh, students of mine is game-based assessment. It represents uh, technology and how we are learning increasingly via technology or using it as a platform. So game-based assessment is a way to engage with technology and to engage in this embedded fluid dynamic assessment. Uh, uh, game-based assessment is, uh, 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 can be geared to wherever the students are in terms of their learning. They can uh, trace where they are, where their uh, weaknesses, challenges are, provide them, support them with additional material and help them and scaffold them as they move to the next proficiency level, level or, or whatever the level of attainment is. Next. So um, this is just to get us started with the conversation and I'm gonna ask uh, our panelists to comment, add, subtract, and uh, just chime in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Micheline, for taking us through that. That was a stimulating and interesting introduction to our topic today. Um, so I want to start us out now with some questions. Um, and I want to think, I want to bring us to thinking about the context of large scale standardized assessments, particularly in the United States. I think a lot of um, folks in Cal's audiences are familiar with these testing uh, projects. Um, can you talk about sort of how this multilingual orientation aligns or does not align with our current practices? Are you asking me or the whole panel? Oh, please, I'm sorry, Micheline, please go ahead. Yeah, this is no, a question no. for you. Or would you Say like, again. yeah, Say absolutely. Again. Could you talk a little bit about um, what, where you see, do you see multilingual orientations at all in any of our standardized testing practices right now in the United States? Some would argue that when we give alternative assessment and we allow students to actually show their knowledge uh, using uh, a language other than English, I'm talking here in the US, some might look at that as multilingual based assessment. Um, I have concerns about perhaps that's a step in the right direction given that we didn't give them that option before. So this is positive, however, the orientation here, and that's why I use the word orientation and ideology and perspective in my slide. The orientation is to quickly move the students away from this language crutch that is the second language so that they can perform in a monolingual fashion. And typically it's at the expense of the second, third and other languages. So I see it as a sad state of affairs. We've made progress, but this is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about truly interactive languages that are equally respected and utilized 
in order to move forward with communication, move forward with learning rather than idealizing one language over other languages. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it does. And to, to, to just to um, uh, clarify things a little bit for our audience, would you say you see a dis distinction between content tests and language tests in that regard? Well, when we talk about content testing, such as testing math or testing of science, or that language is not what is being tested here. Math is the construct. And when language becomes uh, uh, influencing students' performance, we call that a uh, 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 method effect. That is the language is uh, uh, playing tricks. And we don't want the language to be what is the object of measurement. It is math that is the object of measurement. And that's not what I'm espousing here. It is a different orientation completely. Language and content interact in important ways. We store the content in a language uh, um, uh, mediated mm. box, if you will. And so it's a different role that language and content play. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I want to turn now um, to, to Justin. Justin, I want you to help us think about the way that assessment takes place within larger systems, right? Because assessments we know don't just spring up from um, you know, the, 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 the will of test publishers. Can you talk to us a little bit more about the role that standards play in large scale standardized assessments and particularly in language assessments? Sure. Um, and you know, I am speaking from um, the perspective of largely of industry here. Um, my, my, most of my experience is in industry. I'm not really a researcher, um, but I do have a lot of experience in um, development of, of tests. So I'd be happy to talk about standards. So um, in large scale standardized assessments, standards generally do represent the backbone of the assessment. Um, standards kind of describe what language learners are expected to um, be able to do with language. Um, and the standards serve to guide both uh, instruction and assessment. And, you know, as, um, as Micheline did point out, you know, sometimes like that gets shoved more towards the assessment piece because of kind of the high stakes nature of the assessment. And, you know, there's some um, teaching to uh, the test sometimes, but ideally, you know, the standards are developed by researchers and represent, you know, um, developmental arcs and, and, and ways that uh, um, students, students learn language and, and scale. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of um, importance of the standards in, um, in these large scale standardized assessments. Um, and in terms of assessment, tell, test developers create tasks aligned to the standards. Um, you know, we have standard setting that sets cut scores, you know, based on um, very integral to uh, the large, large scale assessments. Um, and you know, the idea is that if an assessment is uh, functioning as intended, test users can make inferences about the language ability of examinees based on their performance on the assessment. And you know, this is this is the the current state of affairs. Um, and you know, just thinking about some of the some of the very thought provoking things that um, Micheline is bringing up, you know, um, at first glance, language standards. Uh, might seem to be portable to the context of uh, multilingual assessments. So, you know, if generally speaking, if a set of standards describe what a language learner can do with language at various stages in development, they could also be used to describe what a learner could do with their entire linguistic repertoire um, throughout their multiple stages of development. Um, so, you know, I don't feel like um, standards are necessarily in, in conflict 
with um, you know the the multilingual approach to assessment that Micheline is bringing up. I do think there's some challenges, and I'm just going to bring up one. Um, you know, the approach uh, to multilingual assessments um, that that Micheline is is citing in in her slides um, is you know these the standards um in 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 the current formulations generally define language expectations in in terms of a proficiency scale um and that's usually a proficiency scale in a named language um and so you know i think A lot of the literature on translang and you know the the notion of um, you know named languages. So the question is, um, how do we define multilingual proficiency? What is this construct that we're defining? Um, and like, how would we transform standards so that you know stakeholders can make inferences about student language ability or communication ability? Um, within such a multilingual assessment framework that's still large scale and standardized. And I think, you know, if we really do want to push the envelope here, that's kind of the, the critical question that's going to need to be answered um, before we can really, you know, move forward. It's really, you know, drilling down on um, this construct of uh, what what is multilingual proficiency or or you know multilingual communication ability so um i think that uh, is um where i was kind of thinking about standards in 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 the context of this discussion thank you thank you so much justin and um I think we um, we're having a little little glitch with your audio here and there, but I think we can hear what you're saying clearly. But um, just wanted to let you know that um, as we think also about the input of of educational stakeholders um, of classroom educators, teachers, principals, other folks who really work day to day with kids um, and with students, not just children, but um, What's been your experience with the input that educators have in um, both standardized assessments and, and, and if you have background on this on, um, on input into standards, you know, thinking about how we can reshape those systems, are there places where those classroom educators that have that day-to-day -day knowledge of the impact of assessment on students and on instruction, do they have those opportunities? Have you seen some of those? Yeah, I mean, educators play a, a huge, crucial role in in various phases of uh, test development, um, and and actually, as you pointed out, um, they often have you know a very very important uh, input into the development of standards. Um, but throughout, you know, once you even get past the development of the standards, and you're you're you know focused on just the development of the large scale standardized assessments. Um, you know, educators are involved from initial conceptualization. Um, you know, there's focus groups and surveys and brainstorming activities to bring the perspective of the student population to bear, um, you know, on the assessment so that it is, you know, the best that it can possibly be within the, in the confines of, um, you know some of the some of the policy things that that Micheline pointed out, Department of Ed peer review and and so forth. Um, but you know, in terms of you know, in terms of evidence centered design, um, you know, which comes from um, Ms. Levy and colleagues, um, the input from educators uh, contributes to um, the the validity system of the assessment. So. Most, most specifically domain analysis, domain modeling, and the student model and the task model are some examples of where, you know, the, all of the, the educator perspective really um, is, is central to um, the validity of the assessment. Um, and then once you get past that kind of like initial design phase and you're, you're into kind of like pure production mode, um, you know, 
we involve educators in so many different steps in our process. Um, item writing, item review, um, cognitive labs and pilots. Um, and then, you know, once, once you get past, um, you know, once, once an item has gone into field testing, um, educators participate in, in uh, post field test reviews, statistical reviews, and also in standard setting. And standard setting is like a real interesting place where, you know, educators are involved in like this really important policy piece because the standard setting, you know, yes, it's like a statistical manipulation, but it really is like, uh, you know, it's driving policy because standard setting is setting where, you know, cut scores are, which often is related to, you know, exiting uh, students from EL services. And we're talking about, you know, K-12 um, English tests. I mean, you know, if we're talking about, you know, DOD tests, it's a little bit different, but um, so yeah, test developers rely on educators in all of these development phases. Um, and it would be difficult to argue that an assessment meets the needs of the stakeholders, not to mention quality assurance standards and Department of Ed peer review guidelines, um, if these stakeholder, um, if the state stakeholder input was not um, not present. Um, yeah. I do want to just say like a couple, just a couple more points really quickly. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, I, I do think that a lot of educators would really welcome um, this approach to, to multilingual assessment, you know, I just glanced at the, the comments and there's, you know, uh, real challenges with, you know, all of the testing and, you know, the computer based testing kind of like takes away from the ability of um, teachers to, to actually teach. Um, you know, I, th I think the one the one big challenge is that, you know, performance assessments that require face to face administration and scoring put a lot of additional burden on educators in terms of, you know, just like sit there. OK, I'm going to have to administer uh, a 40 minute test to, you know, all 60 of my students or something like that or 100 of my students. So, you know, we have to find the, the, the line that makes assessments that best serve the students, but are also logistically streamlined. Um, I also think that it's important, like, you know, if we're making a, these um, multilingual assessments, it's important not to marginalize mono, monolingual language educators that have spent their lives, um, you know, serving students. These ESL teachers that have been in the classroom for a long time, and, you know, they might know a little bit of another language, but, you know, they might not feel, um, you know, able to administer a test that involves translanguaging because their their L two might they might not feel that it's strong enough. So you know, how do you um, best communicate this change in you know assessment research and you know move towards assessment policy, but still involve all educators um, in the process and not kind of like you know, leave, leave some educators by the wayside. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Justin, for, for that in-depth um, walk through some of those places where educators are involved. Micheline, I saw you had your hand up. I'm actually gonna, if you don't mind, um, let each of our panelists have a chance and then maybe we can move into a more um, discussion-based format with some of the questions that are coming out of the chat. I, I wanna now move us out of the US context um, and invite Li Ying to talk to us, um, you know, we've talked about large-scale standardized assessment in the United States. Um, your research is in Canada. Can you tell us something about what you've seen uh, in in terms of large-scale standardized assessment in in the Canadian context? Uh, thank you, Kira, and uh, I'll thank you for all of you who come from all of the world to make the time to join this important event in assessing our uh, multilingual learners. So I'm going to uh, share and discuss uh, three points. And uh, so I'm going to talk about who is the multilingual learner. And uh, I'm going to talk about the function of uh, large scale testing in Canada and maybe share a little bit uh, about our research. So we are actually just talking about multilingual learners in the context of North America, US and Canada. So these learners, and they have brought the language to our schools. 
so the newcomers, the international students, uh, immigrant and refugee students. And there is also students who actually born and uh, grew up in English. And those are our Aboriginal students and they may have a unique language background or not, plus the English. And we also have uh, uh, students grow up in language and cultures entirely as additional language before they come to the school system. So irrespective about the languages and learning background that the, those multilingual learners bring, they land in our classroom learning and studying their school subject through English. And I want you to remember all this different diversity, the heterogeneous group of uh, students have different language proficiency, literacy uh, skills. So they're very different. And uh, I wanted to comment that like, Canada does not really have large scale testing for this multilingual learners. The, all our students are immersed in schools, developing their English and learning through English at the same time. And they are assessed and tested along with learners who are born and grew up in English. Uh, in the province of Ontario, we have grade three, grade six, literacy and numeracy testing, and uh, grade nine, math testing, and grade 10 literacy testing, this is in the secondary school, and six, three are in the elementary school. This educational assessment, they are used for school improvement, and they're used for allocating uh, funding. So therefore, they're designed to be multidimensional, which means they have a lot of the subconstruct, and they're used to give feedback to schools and to the students. So keeping this in mind, and uh, I, I just wanted to uh, kind of like share with you uh, some of the research we have done uh, on the literacy test um, with both group of students. The multilingual learners that I mentioned, the variety of different group of multilingual learners, and the learners who were born and grew up in English, which Justin just mentioned. And for the simple purpose, I'm just calling them ESL students and non-ESL students. So we did a study and together with my team, we look at the grade 10 literacy test. This is at secondary level, all Ontario students must pass the test in order to graduate from their secondary school. So the research question we ask is, will the literacy test impact on second language students? And if so, uh, is the impact related with reading and writing skills? Is it reading and writing format? Is it related with their after school or in school literacy activity? And does their test performance related with the language language or languages spoken at home and are their test performance in relation to their parents' income and education. So there's a whole bunch of uh, studies we look at, a different aspect of uh, literacy uh, studies. So I just want to mention briefly is the non-ESL and ESL students, we wanted to look at them together is for them to see the literacy development trajectory. So the non-ESL students' performance are about 20 to 25% higher than ESL students. So it is not really surprising considering our students are developing their English, but the difficult level for both of the group of students are similar. So it, it is not surprising, but it's also showing the development of the two group of students. We both need to know. For example, there's three reading types. There's the information, the graphic, and the narrative. So the difficult patterns are exactly the same for the two group of students. 
But when we look at the data of our multilingual learners in comparison with the other group of learners, deeply, deeper, and uh, we, we find out the achievement gap is in between the reading type called the narrative. So this is indicating to us as teachers and uh, to say this is area we can actually support our multilingual learners a little bit more. Uh, I just wanted to mention one more related with writing is there's four writing types and news report proved to be that this two group has the largest gap along with summary writing, opinion, and information paragraph. This is telling us that we could really do research into the educational assessment and looking at a differential impact on different groups. So we understand what they share and where is the achievement gap if we are supporting this group of multilingual learners. So that's my brief to comment on Canada. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Li Ying. And, and I wanna pick up because you gave us such a nice segue in talking there about what it is that teachers are doing in their classrooms. So now I wanna to turn to Aida. And Aida, I'd like to ask you in your observation and your um, long experience in working with classroom teachers, um, how have you found, how do teachers understand and interact with the, the very rich linguistic repertoires that their students bring to the classroom? I forgot that I had muted myself. Thank you very much. This is a very <laughs> exciting panel and a very relevant one for educational purposes, both in the United States and abroad. But you know, having worked significantly with teachers and students for several decades, I do not see just one pattern of teachers' reaction to students' multilingual resources. Uh, obviously, there are those that themselves come from multilingual backgrounds and who tend to value very much the resources the students bring. And then there are others who uh, somehow think that you know, English is the language of the whole world, not having traveled or learned other languages, and they think this is the way it ought to be. Um, so there's great variation, but what I want to really talk about is not just not understanding the linguistic backgrounds of students in many cases, but actually not even understanding that students have a wealth of experiences and knowledge that they bring to the classroom that goes beyond the language and uh, which has triggered in the United States a really terrible phenomenon, which is the presence in middle and high schools of what we call now long-term English learners. These are students who have been in the classification of English learners for six or more years. Now, if we look closely at who these students are, we see that 60% of them are students who are native born. So these are students who have studied exclusively in American schools from first grade, and now they are in seventh, eighth, ninth grade, and they are still classified as having limited English proficiency. And this is where the problems come, right? A, uh, if the tests that need, they need to pass are exclusively linguistic, then unfortunately the construct that those tests are built on um, somehow consider that language develops in a sequential way and that it is important that students be accurate in their production. And so A, they limit what students develop and simplify it along this supposed continuum of logical development. But more importantly, it really contradicts the very important notion that we have today. And so here I go to Micheline's important call 
that we reimagine the whole system of assessment that we put our students through. And that is to talk about the simultaneous and integrated development of conceptual understandings, analytic practices, and the language required to do that. Uh, and so if we do that, then uh, students would be talking about A, consequential matters, B, in ways that really honor their critical abilities displayed outside of classes, and C, they would definitely be engaged and push their own intellectual and linguistic development at the same time. So these are um, constructs that test makers make, but that unfortunately impact the lives of our students. And I'll stop there and see whether you well, have another question for me. I, I do, I have a follow-up. Aida, I was, I'm gonna change up the question that I was gonna ask you because I was gonna ask you how teachers currently understand large scale assessment and what it brings to their teaching. But I wonder, could you help us imagine what, what, what would it look like in a world where teachers got from that testing information about their multilingual learners? What would we like to see the information that they receive and how would we like for them to be able to use it? Take us into the future. What would you like to see? Um, imagine well, us forward. Thank you very much for mentioning that really important word, future. And that is that tests today measure past achievement. And so they're always looking back at students' pasts, what they cannot do basically. And what we want instead is to have tests that really look at where students are developing, how they are developing, and how we can accelerate that development, right? Um, in, in a real world, students are tested by a cluster of abilities and the, that weave in conceptual understandings, let's say from history, that weave in at the same time, how well can they um, engage in sourcing, that is understanding who wrote that document, with what perspective, for what purposes, and thus how should I react to that document as opposed to this other document coming from a very different perspective. And ideally, I mean, if you want me to dream about the new possibilities, part of them would engage students in collaborative discussions about documents and then they go individually and write, and they, they themselves self-assess, right? Uh, of course, these are not the kind of large-scale standardized testing. And so thinking again about a future, I think right now, large-scale standardized testing take way too much importance and way too much time, have a negative backwash effect on the lives of teachers and students. For example, New York City has testing next week. And all of this week, if not last week and this week, are being spent on preparing for the test. Now, that really is educational malpractice. Because at least if the tests were good, the kinds of tests that we really would value because they have students working together, thinking together, and then applying individually what they distill from that collaboration, which are the kinds of skills we want students to have in the 21st century, right? Um, then uh, perhaps preparing for the test would be great because the test measures worthy activities that citizens will engage in in the future. But the kinds of atomistic tests that we have today will indeed not serve. And if we go back to the issue of those students who are bureaucratically labeled long-term English learners, and you talk to them, their oral English is a la par with native speakers of English. And you wonder why are they trapped in the category? And the reason for it is that these categories also depend on testing in mathematics and testing in English language arts. So students do not just need to pass a test of English as a language, but they also need to pass those other tests. 
But when teachers guided by understandings that these are still English learners have simplified their subject matter content for them, then of course they have not prepared them to engage in the kinds of activities that would eventually lead to standardized testing. So I think what we need to do, because I know that standardized testing will not disappear from the face of the United States in at least a decade, let's hope shorter than that. I would say let's diminish the impact of standardized testing. And let us instead consider what Micheline has called learning oriented assessment. So the types of exercises where students engage in activity and what is revealed is the next frontier for learning and the budding developments that students are engaging in so as to become self-fulfilled and contributing citizens in society. Thank you, thank you, Aida. Um, I, I, I want to continue on this theme when we were um, chatting a little bit before this event, um, some of our um, contributors here were talking about the speculative fiction that we enjoy. Um, so Micheline, I'm going to encourage you also to kind of dream the future a little bit. Um, if you think about the context where you might see multilingual approaches to assessment that do support students' success emerge at scale, can you talk about where, which context might you see that approach starting to emerge? And this is a question for Micheline. So um, I appreciated the comments that my colleagues have made. And uh, I feel that Trey probably represented a different perspective than the rest of the panelists. And, uh, in many ways, he is re re uh, uh, representing reality on the ground right now for somebody who has to do testing uh, with uh, uh, policy mandates, with resources that are limited, and an orientation that is prevalent. So I don't want to discount at all the perspective that Trey is providing. I think it is important, and in many ways, Many of us, most of us who work in testing, that's the kind of work that we do. So what I was talking about, Kira, is actually future oriented. So my whole presentation, if people look at it, it is all future oriented, right? So if I were to say more about what it would look like, I would simply expand on what I said earlier. And so when I talked about game-based assessment, it's not for me, the, the, the impetus for that is not because people, I want them to sit and play. It's a very serious endeavor to actually do game-based assessment. When you look at the level of engagement, the amount of time that people spend, the scaffolding that is typically provided to students so that they are able to move to the next level of skill in the game and so on, are the kinds of things that Aida is talking about. It's to scaffold them, show their strengths, show them how they can capitalize on that so they, they can advance. Whereas now, the way we do the testing is exactly the way she described it. Tell me what you know with regard to what I want to find out rather than meeting the student where the student is, we bring the student into the mix according to our own rules. Having said that, the reality is we do mass teaching. We do not do privileged teaching where we teach one-on-one. -on -one. The reality of schools is that you have one teacher and X number of students with different interests, different abilities and so on. How can the teacher, even with support, cater to individualized needs? And when you add proficiency is not uh, uh, homogeneous amongst these students. They come with different proficiency levels. They come with different literacy levels in the first language. And so it becomes a very complex endeavor. I think 
the way we are moving with technology, there could be a great deal of support to provide uh, mass personalization of learning. We see companies beginning to talk about this, offer it, the math lab and so on to people. I think some of these will continue to develop an assessment embedded into them. But what I said before, and I say again, what is important here is the orientation. What is it that we think we are doing? What are our goals? How do we define success, right? As we have in the title. So I have slide 11, uh, 15, 13 in my presentation that talks about success. How do we define success? A politician might define success very different from a teacher, very different from a parent, very different from a student, very different from somebody who is renting a house next door to me. So this is a very loaded term. We need to clarify that. And I think we cannot engage in practice without clarifying the orientation. The orientation is key. Does that? Answer. Thank you. Yes, yes. And just um, a friendly amendment. It's my colleague, Justin. I think you, I think you said Trey, but um, Justin. Oh, I'm sorry, Justin. Justin. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and Justin said an apology that there's some, some heavy weather in his part of the world. Those of you in the Washington DC metro area may, like me, have been under a tornado warning and seeking some shelter yesterday evening. And I think we're seeing the um, the impacts of that storm. So Justin is camera off, but I, I, I hope he's still with us. Um, yeah, apparently I'm seeing in the chat that it, that it's very um, windy. Um, thank you, thank you to all of you for your wonderful insights today. Um, we do have some time for some further discussion and some questions. Um, so I'm gonna ask Trey if you have a question that you could queue up from us from the Q&A. Pretty, pretty windy here in DC. So my, my internet's been kind of shoddy as well, but looking at our Q&A, by the way, if you haven't submitted a question yet, please feel free to, we'll be looking at these uh, and we're gonna try to wrap up around 3.30. So we should have a lot of time to get to these questions. The first one- and Just that, as a reminder, Oh, Trey, does. you're only looking at the questions in the Q&A and not in the chat. So if yeah. you've put something in the chat and you want it as a question for the Q&A, please post it there. Thank you. That's right. Thank you, Justin. It's an important note. Uh, there's a lot going on in the chat. Tough to keep up with. But if you do have a specific question, and even if you want to address it to a specific person or the whole panel, just let us know. Um, one a uh, question that stands out to me, Kira, that I would pose to the group is a pretty straightforward one, which you've talked a little bit about, which is defining what it means to be a multilingual learner. Um, Valeria teaches in a school on the border of Mexico, and many of her students, she says, are L1 heritage speakers, but do not receive any education in their L1. Um, all of the K-12 education that they've received is in English, um, however, the college has created some specific English composition classes for multilingual learners. Um, so I guess going back to the original question, how would you define multilingual learners and clearly what kind of um, implications and impact does that have when you're uh, determining what assessments to use and how to assess those assessments? Oh, good question. So who, who, who's a multilingual learner? Who is that? Arlinda, do you want to jump in first? I think you should go first, Micheline. Okay. Because you so, had some provoking thoughts. So you can look at a multilingual learner very simply as a learner who has more than one language. You can start from there. <laughs> and uh, what I saw in the question is, uh, and I alluded to that in my answer to Kira just a second ago when I said these students come to the classroom with different uh proficiency levels so even if we're talking about just two languages arabic and english somebody's arabic uh student x is very different from student y these have different experiences perhaps in schooling 
in learning the Arabic language, in uh, the subject areas that were covered. And so no two students are alike. And that's what makes uh, English language or uh, a foreign language very messy because students have very different backgrounds in terms of literacy and in terms of proficiency. So at a very simple level, I would say any student with more than one language, then that person is multilingual. And you may say that um, ah, the dialect. So in Arabic, for example, there is the standard variety and then there is the dialect. So if somebody speaks a dialect but does not speak a standard variety of Arabic, would you say that person is fluent in Arabic? Uh, some would say not, that's a dialect and it's, it's not a language and they wouldn't even consider that or honor that as a language. So it gets very messy at a very simple level. Again, it's a repertoire of more than one language. But after that, let's talk. I would like to um, have a, a word on this as well, because I focus mostly on middle and high school students and teachers in the United States. And I visit hundreds of classes a year and they do a lot of research in classrooms. And the one thing that to me is troubling is an apparent but not contested or examined notion that some teachers have that translanguaging in the classroom is to be done by all, including the teacher himself or herself. Now, let's imagine the class is an English language arts class and students are reading Steinbeck's The Pearl. And so now students are discussing in Spanish because that's supposed to be translanguaging. And the teacher who doesn't speak Spanish gives a few directions in his or her limited Spanish, and then they are translanguaging. And to me, this is an aberration. First of all, given the increasing number of bureaucratically labeled long-term English learners, I think, and in high schools where the ELA class takes only 50 minutes a day I think there is an urgency in developing English as much as possible. Obviously, there has to be tremendous respect for students negotiating in their languages if they have somebody to interact with in their family languages, things they don't understand. But it's like time is at a prime. And uh, by Ha, uh, by enabling class to be totally in Spanish under the false premise that we value translanguaging deprives students of access to robust and generative subject matter learning and it deprives them of developing the language that after all is the language of privilege in society. And now that doesn't mean that their languages are not respected. In fact, ideally in a high school class, if most of the students are Spanish speaking, there should be classes in literature, one course in literature in Spanish or one course about uh, you know, current affairs in Spanish. But uh, on the other hand, we mustn't confuse respect for the language with a lack of urgency and good appropriate use of the very limited time that, it, that there exists for developing subject matter understanding and the English that is required to talk about it and write about it. Thank you, thank you for that, Aida. That's a really insightful um, way to think about, about that situation. Uh, I'd like Trey, to jump yeah, in, but please, I'd carry like, on. May, if Li Ying or, or Justin want to say something before I address uh, what Aida just raised. No, you, you can go ahead. Uh, I actually just wanted to comment on one thing is for us to remember is when we were talking about multilingual learners and we need to think about this is more than just language. 
because the language is rolled with the cultural background and with the education experience that the learners take with them. And it doesn't really matter what labels we're going to use, the key we wanted to support them is to make sure those learners are successful and that our assessment demonstrate that they can learn through whichever language that they do. So I think that that's one of the keys I want to comment it on. Li Yang, the phrase I often hear people say, um, uh, I've heard it over the past sort of couple of years, recent phrases, to bring your whole self, to, yes. to be able to, to have all aspects yeah. of yourself be present. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Micheline, did you have a, a remark you wanted yes, to follow I, up? I, yeah. I greatly appreciate what Li Ying just said right now um, and what you said, bring your whole self. And that's what I say in one of the uh, boxes when I talk about what is success, it's about honored identity and being and respect for that. What Aida is raising is um, boots on the ground. She's talking about these individuals need to go out and operate in a society where language is English. And so in school, we cannot rob them of the opportunity to develop the skills they need to operate in society. Who can disagree with that, right? Who can? In good conscience. However, what I think this might look like um, this is a, 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 a camouflage for not teaching what you need to teach. She said, this is an ELA class. If this is a math class and the teacher is not teaching math, the teacher would be looked at. You're not teaching math. And so substitute the word ELA for math and you see what's happening, Aida, right? right. So that's bad practice and to use translanguaging as the camouflage to cover up for not doing what you're supposed to do, which is teach English in an ELA class. That's not what we're talking about here right. at all. Agreed completely. Yeah. That, that's a re that's a really interesting comment. And it, remind, it, it is mirrored in a comment that someone dropped in the question that I feel like is relevant for to further the discussion. An anonymous attendee wrote, do we really need to describe our students as multilingual or should we rather describe the teachers? Why do we segregate students into categories? Is it not easier to describe our teachers as, quote, able to serve uh, any student, uh, including multilingual, multilingual ones as well? So an interesting idea there. Um, I'll move on to another question that we have in the Q&A as well from Ruth. And this is a kind of a straightforward question, but I'm sure it will generate some discussion. Okay. Would it be beneficial? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's always these are a straightforward question here. Would it be beneficial to assess students in both languages, for example, English and insert your language for a 90-10 program? Would it be beneficial to ass assess a student in both languages? Aida? I'll, I'll jump on that one. Um, I think it's fair to assess students in the language that the class has been conducted. Because if, for example, I am studying physics in English, and then I am assessed in Spanish in physics, I don't necessarily have the ability to talk about those issues, uh, physical uh, physics, conceptualizations, processes, et cetera, right, in Spanish. So, um, Oftentimes people think if we only test students in their family languages, we solve the problem. But that is not true. Uh, I myself, you know, the first time I had to go back home and give a lecture, I lacked the language to talk about sociolinguistic processes, although Spanish was my native language, and although my bachelor's was in Spanish and all the rest. Um, of course, nothing that I couldn't learn in one day. But still, you know, it's like you cannot be tested in a language about very specialized knowledge that is developed in another language. Can I jump in and uh, just to add to say, um, 
Is that a reality? Could we do this in educational assessments? For example, uh, in the math uh, test, and we ask students to uh, do the calculation, like one plus one equals two, and, uh, and then draw the problem, and then answer it to say how I get there how I did that calculation. So there's three steps that's built into numeracy test uh, here in Ontario. So is it a possible for us to allow the learners to do the three types in different languages? Like maybe the calculation in English, I, I don't know uh, if the problem writing about the problem, the communicating of how I get there, one plus one equals two, could be in another language. So I'm throwing this to the panel to see, will that be a possibility in our education assessment some days? I don't or half see. and a half. Or what? Like it could be half, could be I write something in English, but the keywords in another language, for example. It, okay, my favorite phrase, right? We all use it when we teach. It depends, <laughs> right? It depends. And so before I go to that, I just want to go back to what Aida is saying. I totally agree with you. It is difficult to separate the language from the content. So um, I grew up not speaking, I mean, I grew, English was a second language, is it was a foreign language. I grew up speaking Arabic. And so I had the similar situation. I was asked to give a talk. I can't do it in Arabic. I cannot talk about validity and reliability, standard error of measurement. It would take me more than one day. You're better. <laughs> Uh, a, a learner than I am. It would take me longer than one day to actually do the transition. But what that emphasizes is language and content happen together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what Li Ying is saying is, can we throw in a flexibility in testing? And if you're doing a standardized, and Justin can speak to that, how do you do it? If you're doing standardized testing, large scale standard, it becomes very messy. But I think if you are doing it with technology, the way I was talking about in the uh, uh, slides, then it's e-personalization. It's, it's personalized rather than mass testing. We're talking about personalized testing. And then we can look at the resources that a student can deploy to solve a problem and we're looking at the processes, which we haven't talked about yet. I think it's important to start looking not just at the outcome, but looking at the processes when we're talking about multilingual. And it is possible the same way we talk about different proficiency level students engage different processes, then we will see probably the same thing here. Having uh, uh, learned Arabic as a first language, it was a dialect. I learned standard Arabic in schools. And so uh, if I were given the option to do the exam, let's say in Arabic or in English, would they give me the option of a dialect or would it be standard? If it is standard, then that becomes a test in and of itself. And so that's why I say it depends. We have to look at the uh, uh, particularities of the language, the purpose for which we are assessing, and then start to ferret out how we go about doing it. And just following up on that, Micheline, I think, you know, and, and also going back to what Aida said, like, maybe we do focus on diminishing the role of the standardized assessments. And... I'm, and I'm even going, you know, either even further back into testing. So, so much of language tests came out of the tradition of psychological testing. And one of the big, um, like, uh, emphases in, like, in psychological testing is you, you don't really try to make a decision 
based on a single measure, right? You, you, you um, administer multiple measurements and use that to kind of triangulate, you know, if so, if you're, if you're trying to assess if someone has some kind of like psychological disorder, but, you know, I think that kind of has gotten lost in language testing where there is this focus on, okay, they got this test score, so we should make our decisions based on all of, based on this test score. And, you know, and, and this is coming from someone that works in large scale testing, but, you know, I don't think that we should always make a decision on students based on a single test score. I think there should be, you know, more focus on formative assessment and, you know, and maybe that way you don't have to focus so much on teacher preparation in the classroom, pre preparing the students for this test. You know, it's, it can be large scale and it can be standardized, but maybe the stakes of that assessment go down some. And, you know, I think the, the problem is, or the challenge there is that like the policy landscape is, has, has kind of prevented that. So, um, you know, that's the rub and, 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 you know, that like um, I did notice that, that Sam from WIDA posted in the chat, you know, for people to, to give, give WIDA feedback and, you know, that like everybody on the ground is who needs to be clamoring for, for change at the policy level. It can't just be the researchers or just the test developers. It has to be everybody. Um, so. Well said, Justin, there's a, there is a, in fact, all of this, and I was trying to allude to that in some of your, my questions to you, about standards earlier, but in the United States context, there is a larger policy framework um, around policy accountability and testing. And those of us, you know, in, in this world who are, um, our aims are to ensure that those multilingual learners are identified and are provided with the educational supports that they need work within that policy landscape. Mm -hmm. Uh, Trey, do we have time for one last question? I do, we do, we do. We have five minutes. I think this is our last one. Would uh, have, have uh, I, I have like three or four questions I've written down. Is there anyone that stood out to you in particular that you'd like to look at, or do you want me to go ahead? Oh gosh, why don't you vamp for me? Because I am. <laughs> go ahead, Trey. Yeah, we're very busy. Um, let's see. I wanted to go to Jessica. Let me scroll up. We've got a lot of questions. Um, uh, a question about testing for learning challenges for English learners. How can the test be valid if they're learning the language of the test itself? A translated test may be good, but assuming the test is English normed, does the translation even matter? Also, what if the student isn't literate in their first language, their L1? Uh, how do we validate that kind of test? Right. What an excellent question. How do we know in tests? How do we know in, in those content area tests? How do we know if we're actually understanding what it is this, the student knows and can do? Anyone want to take that one? Are we talking about tests that have been translated? Yes. I think I, um, among others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I did work in, in test translation for a little while. So um, the way that that it kind of worked uh, in terms of validation is that there would, you would develop the test in English, you would validate the test, you know, do all the stats, make sure that, you know, all, everything looked right. And then you would translate the, the test into the target language. And, um, and then, but that, it wasn't just like a single one-way translation. Um, we actually conducted translation verification studies to kind of with like educators that were multilingual to kind of confirm that the construct wasn't changing um, through the translation. So the validation was kind of like through transitivity. It wasn't like a directly, it wasn't directly validated. And that was just due to the, the levels of funding, like just doing the translation of the tests was expensive and, um, and the state didn't have the funds. And then you have to do like equating studies and, and things like that, that, um, Micheline might be able to talk to a little bit more, but, um, that's, that's kind of how it, 
worked when I when I worked on test translations themselves. Yeah, I'd like to piggyback on what uh, uh, Justin just said. Um, exactly what he said, there is backward translation, forward translation in order to make sure that what you end up with is exactly uh, equivalent across languages. I've also seen them where they go about actually developing the test in the two languages simultaneously. So it's not that you start with English and you translate into Spanish or vice versa. You're developing the test simultaneously together. And so they inform one another in both languages. And so that's just uh, what uh, uh, Justin is also talking about. I know that we're running out of time and I just wanna uh, uh, comment on things that we said earlier. Uh, when we talked about teacher involvement, I cannot emphasize how educators are not as involved as they should be in the standardized testing operation. And there is a great deal of research, published research, peer reviewed research that shows that teachers br are brought in perhaps as a focus group and then they're sent home and that's the extent of their involvement in the development of anything. And often, and that varies from state to state, often in many states, it is a top-down approach. It is not percolating from the classroom and the teachers. I feel we have lost the teacher in all of this. And that connects me to something that was said about the need to respect what the teacher brings into the mix. We keep asking them to do more and more. And now we want them to translate language on top of everything else. Goodness gracious, who wants to be a teacher these days, right? And my comment to that is this. We have limited resources and I need to give these resources perhaps in the form of interpretation services to a group of students. I can only give it to X numbers. So if, should I give it to Spanish people? If I can give it also to those who are speaking Urdu or another language or be in the name of equity, I don't give it to anybody. That's not how it works. I give it where I can. And the same with the monolingual teacher. If a teacher cannot trans language, does that mean I shouldn't look at other teachers who can trans language and provide the professional development that is needed. And so I see it as, it's not that I'm dumping more on the educators, but it is recognizing the reality on the ground and promoting a professional development process where the educator is respected and resources are deployed so that we can do this right. Thank you so much, Micheline. And, and I, I apologize. Friends, we, we are going to have to, to oh. wrap up. We're at the end of our time. Micheline, thank you for ta taking us out on that question of resources. Um, and perhaps those resources shouldn't be as limited as they are. Um, I would like to say gracias and merci and shukran and siesie and dankeschön to all of our participants today. Trey, do you want to take us out? Yes, I'd just like to say thank you to our four, uh, five, I should say, wonderful speakers, our four present presenters, and Kira for doing a wonderful job of moderating and keeping us on track. Thank you so much. You all deserve a big round of applause, which I can hear through the internet now. Finally, thank you. I, I, I want to thank you. I think the hard audience. job was Kira's. I think Kira always takes on the hard jobs because she can handle it. Uh, I want to thank you, our audience, for your questions and comments and your enthusiasm on this pro important issue. Um, but it doesn't stop today. We encourage you to share what you've learned with your colleagues. And to that end, we'll be sending a recording of this webinar to you via email shortly uh, uh, later on this uh, next week. If you can find this event uh, on cal.org, please share it with your friends as well. And again, uh, join us for one of our upcoming webinars, which you can find on cal.org as well. Thank you all. And we hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank Bye you. now. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.